ignore my hairline, it's going through stuff. Hi, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home skillet biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat. You like my Britney Spears shimmy? The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Side note, not that anybody asks, but a new development in my life. I have decided to uh, orchestrate my day as if I have a nine to five. For my creators out there, you know how I feel. For those who have been able to work at home at like any time you can do things, you'll understand my struggle. You never really feel like you're done working. And that's worked for me for years, but in the last, Six months? No, no, that's not gonna do it. Uh, yesterday was the first day um, and I'm upset because it really worked. <laughs> like I was done with all the things I had planned for the day by 4.30, again, nine to five. Well, what do I do with all this time now? I guess this is when people like exercise and take up hobbies, mind blown. Oh my God. We're gonna see if this holds up because I have a really bad habit of working every day. Like every, I don't have weekends. <laughs> and I'm trying to make a concerted effort to have weekends. So yeah, that's my little reminder for those of you who, uh, who are creators who don't know how to turn off. Here's your sign to actually organize your day so that you uh, keep your sanity. Okay, cool. There you go. Are there any other updates? Oh, I watched the Love is Blind 2 reunion. Well, all of season two, but then the reunion. <sighs> I have never been so saddened by a person than just watching Shake Flounder. Would you guys want a video on Love is Blind? Do you care? Would that be like a midweek video you guys would be interested in? Let me know, cause I might, it might take me a while to get to it. So I don't know if anyone will care anymore in like two weeks, but. Put it down in the comment section, I'm curious. So now finally, as you probably saw coming, it's time to send it over to Admiral Kenny so she can secure the channel bag. Hello, it's Admiral Kenny to let you know that today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit delivery service that allows you to eat delicious, healthy, and quick meals straight from the comfort of your own home. Woo woo woo, record sponsor, man. If you're looking for something to take the stress out of meal planning, HelloFresh is just the thing for you. Choose from delicious and quick meals that you can make straight from the comfort of your own home with pre-portioned ingredients that come straight delivered to your front doorstep. Most meals can be made in under 30 minutes and some can even be made in around 20 if you get those like lightning fast meals. Or if you're a G like me, who's been doing HelloFresh for a little while now, it comes like second nature. I can get that bad boy done in 25 minutes. Feel free to customize your meals, add pre-cooked proteins, desserts, and sides, and allow yourself to go to the grocery store fewer times out of the week, cause it sucks. This week was a soup because it's rainy outside and it's still cold. It was like a chicken sausage kale couscous type thing, really good. It came with like ciabatta so that you can make cheesy ciabatta toast with it. But I've decided I'm gonna use that for an avocado toast situation. That's gonna be so good. If you'd like to check out HelloFresh, feel free to go to hellofresh.com and use code Kenny16 for 16 free meals, plus a few free gifts. Big thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery, baby. So last week uh, we returned to the long awaited wonderland that is Neil Breen film. We had fun at the expense of his uh, Twisted Pair, a movie about everything and about nothing at the same time. Um, if you'd like to check that movie out or that video out, you can check it out up above or you can check it out in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist. And this week, we're returning to a crowd favorite. The Biscuits love passion flicks. I love passion flicks, but I try to avoid going on there too often because sometimes I can get sucked into it and then the next five videos are passion flicks. I think of passion flicks much like a toxic ex. You go back to get closure only to have your time and your patience wasted again. As much as I make fun of it, I love a sh romance and passion flicks is is that in a streaming service like my actual dating life over the last six months has been hilarious and i need a respite damn it so for our newer people if you don't know what passion flicks is it's a streaming site devoted to turning crappy romance novels into even crappier film adaptations we've talked about many uh films from the site at this point because there it's unending but there's been a series that i've been focusing on a lot and i think i'm gonna break away a little bit because it's it's making me mad <laughs> like it's frustrating me and that is 
what we're talking about today, we're talking about Gabriel's Inferno. Well, specifically Gabriel's Rapture, which is now the fourth movie in the Gabriel Inferno series. Passion Flicks has decided to milk it for every part it's worth by turning each book so far into at least two movies. The first book, Gabriel's Inferno, had three different movies, all of which I've covered. You can check that out linked below. I'll ha you'll probably need to watch them if this is your first time walking in because this is the fourth movie. The second book, Gabriel's Rapture, so far has two films as of filming this. Um, I don't know if they're gonna do a third one. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I believe in total there's three or four books. So that means we're gonna have to sit through nine to 12 movies if they plan to do three <laughs> movies per book. And one of the core issues I have with that is that so little happens so far in these last few movies. Why did we need to split this up in parts? Like nothing's happening. Literally the last movie, a third of it was them Gabriel's Inferno is one of the many horrible things that have been birthed from Twilight. So, you know, there's a lot of this sort of anticipation around them having sex for the first time. So I get like it being a big deal, considering we've waited two and a half movies to watch it, but a third of the movie, like, wow. So now we're in Gabriel's Rapture, second book. They've already had sex. And now it's their life as a couple. We are still with Julia Mitchell, who is a master's student studying Dante-focused Italian literature. And her professor, Gabriel Emerson, has a cocaine-riddled sex demon past with a baby mama and a mommy dom somewhere in there just sprinkled in for, for fun. And through all that, he was still able to finish his dissertation. <laughs> Impressive, truly. Shit, I need to level up. <laughs> Only thing stopping me from aiming higher is depression. But they are in love and they are together. There's a lot of creepiness in, in that fact, but I'll let the last three videos speak for itself in that regard. Be a piddle. Uh, we're supposed to ignore all of that because, you know, a violin is playing in the background and it's on passion flicks, so. We just have a square-headed tall man who's dark, brooding, has a salacious past, and speaks as if he memorized passages from Ruby Core. Now, though this movie is tackling a bit more than the last movie, again, the last movie, a third of it was them having sex for the first time, this is still pretty draggy. It's like, I want to know what's going to happen because I've already invested four movies at this point. So I'm going to finish. When is the other shoe going to drop? I'm bored. Somebody starts snatching wigs. But especially that first half, if not more of this movie, pacing wise is really, really clunky and hard to get through. But I did. And since I did, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> so without further ado, this is Gabriel's Rapture because I wanted to say Inferno again. Part one. I made the foolish assumption that once we got past the first book, so the first three movies, that we'd finally get a different opening sequence. But nope, still a Requiem Lacrimosa playing for their love story. But they did switch up the, the film aspect a little bit. They wanted you know to differentiate in that regard, but largely it's the exact same intro. And we're taking off from Julia and Gabriel having sex from the first time. Again, they're in Italy while he's there for like a lecture or conference, something for work. They're still hiding their relationship as student teacher because he would get fired. So I find it quite a, a bad idea, honestly, <laughs> to take your student on this trip, even if you know, you know, I just love her so much, like it's stupid. But they had just had sex for the first time um, for Julia, it was her first time ever. She lost her virginity. Um, and they're on cloud nine. They're like, wow, our relationship is like so strong. I love you. You are my angel. You are my Beatrice. You are my Bella, 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 There is some concern about, you know, Gabriel's past in the sense that he still gets contacted by a woman named Paulina. And I was like, who? Who's Paulina? I first thought it was Mommy Dom because she hasn't been back for like two movies. I was like, oh, what happened to her? No, we haven't mentioned her since she appeared that one time. Um, This apparently is um the mother of Gabriel's deceased child. I think that was the last movie where we found out that he was with this woman and they were together, you know, sexually purely for a while. Um, And they ended up, they both, we're in their drug 
bender type situation. They ended up having a child named Maya. The child ended up dying under circumstances that I don't think we ever really found out. She just passed away. Um, and it sent both of them into, you know, their own respective depressive episodes. Gabriel got a vasectomy afterwards because he doesn't want anyone to have him as a father. Paulina had a breakdown. So yeah, apparently that's Paulina. Um, and she's calling and that makes, you know, um, Julia feel uncomfortable because it's like, why is she calling you? You know, she's not a part of your life anymore. Why why does she feel that she can contact you, you know? And he kind of says like, well, I'm not gonna answer. So it doesn't really matter what she's calling for. Red flag, it's a big giveaway, it's a dead giveaway. Julia decides to ignore it. She says, eh, okay, fine, we're in love, whatever, in Italy, yay, go Italy. But another factor that's also bothering Julia is her PTSD from her abusive ex, Simon, that attacked her in the last movie. Again, if you haven't seen the other videos, you're probably lost, but I'm gonna try to like guide you through it. Her abusive ex, Simon, came and found her, tried to blackmail her with photos of her performing oral sex on him, attacked her and bit her, causing her to have a scar on her neck. And throughout this movie, we are kind of following her processing that PTSD um, component. And throughout this movie, now that she is um, sexual with Gabriel, it ends up being like a reoccurring thing her trauma around sex. It shows up in her being very concerned about pleasing Gabriel. She feels very critically about herself sexually. Up until this point, the experience she's, any like little experience she had doing some things, though not penetrative sex, um, was criticized by Simon. He would mock her. She wants to improve. She's like really concerned about how well she's doing, you know, stuff like that. Working through her traumas in relation to sex and her desire to get assurance and reassurance from Gabriel. I have mixed feelings about this. Like I do appreciate that it kind of showed it as something that is possible as a result of trauma. But being that Gabriel is gross, <laughs> as we've established in the other movies, he kind of turns this into like, you know, oh, she, she just wants to please me. And it's just like, bleh, bleh. like no bitch, she's traumatized. Like, and by the way, of all the gross things that have like bled into this movie from the other one, that is still one of the ones, one of the top that grosses me out the most. There is a lot of reverence around how up until this point she was un touched, which isn't even true. As a side note, can we talk about virginity really quickly? Cause I find it very interesting that Julia is still considered a virgin. I feel like it's, it, maybe this is me stepping over a line here, but um, I would imagine that this is somewhat, I think how we understand virginity as penetrative sex is homophobic. I've been unpacking that thought a little bit cause a friend brought it up to me. Cause she was like, so, so you're saying that lesbians that have sex for the first time, if there's no penis involved, they didn't have sex. And I was like, I see you, I get it. I don't know where I'm going with that thought, but like, but this idea that again, one of the tropes that come along in romance in general is that Julia wasn't actualized until she had sex penetratively vaginal sex with a man. And virginity is a social construct anyway. I'm a virgin <laughs> on the right day. <laughs> Any man that's had sex with me, no, you haven't. <laughs> Shit, I don't claim these niggas. I am chaste <laughs> and pure as newly fallen snow. Amen. Okay, Lord, deliver, deliver us. Amen. Okay. Take us to the king. Yes. I don't have much to bring. I got so off track, oh my God. Anyway, but yeah, he's like really caught up on her chastity. He, he lets it bleed into his lecture that he ends up giving at uh, this conference, I guess, about Dante or, or about Italian literature or something, art, whatever. A lecture on um, basically female archetypes in Italian art, particularly how Venus represents sexual love but she, but she maintains a vulnerable modesty. Her shyness increases the eroticism of the, I, uh, it's creepy, I'm sorry. Like, it's not new sentiments. He's been doing this, I think since the first movie, 
where he's just like, I'm so happy I'm your first kiss. I'm so happy I'm your first this. I'm so happy you're your first that. And it's just like, Argh. Like, why are you so turned on that she's clueless? Even if she's not underage, there is a creepiness about that. And I stand by it. <laughs> there is something about that. But at this event, uh, Julia ends up meeting a man named Giuseppe, who is a professor of Dante literature himself. Um, it's pretty apparent from the jump that he's interested in Julia and asking her, would she like a drink? And they start talking. She ends up telling him that she is a Italian literature master student as well. She studies Dante. Um, he says that he knows some people at the University of Toronto, which is where she goes to school. And he asks if she is a student of Gabriel, which she swiftly remembers would be a bad idea to admit to. And she's like, no, nah. Mm -mm. Giuseppe uh, really presents himself as being someone who, you know, isn't a fan of Gabriel, which, hey, we're in this together then, dude. Giuseppe continues on to essentially say that Gabriel's entire speech was an embarrassment, which, is, you know, in fairness, just as an audience participant, yeah, it had no structure. It was just him going on about why the Venus is bangable. <laughs> she's chaste and she's a whore. Best of both worlds, baby. Of course, because this is a romance, we have to have like the dick swinging competitive jealousy things. So here comes Gabriel like, um, excuse you, why are you talking to my fiance? If I recall correctly, he has not proposed. So they're not actually engaged. He's just saying it to just say like, get away from my girl, but like get away from my fiance. And this whole like jealous interaction unleashes the dom out of him. So of course he has to do the whole like, let me take you into a different room and 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 claim what's mine. They make out, why am I trying to talk and do this? And at some point she's like, don't bite me, please don't bite me. And that's again, her trauma coming up again. And so he calms down, he chills out stops them from getting like a public indecency charge. I mean, I'd be into it, but I'm afraid of the law. <laughs> I'm afraid to catch a charge just cause I wanted to get clapped next to a statue of David. Like one of the things I noticed very quickly about this movie is that there's like a running list of bitchy antagonistic women. You know, Julia is really seen to be the only, or one of the few, I should say, good women in this, in this movie. And every other woman that ever interacted with Gabriel is like a terrible bitchy person. This is blue. All right, I didn't plan for that, but okay. They changed their formula. These used to be dry as a bitch. Which brings up Bitchy Bangs. Bitchy Bangs is what I'm gonna call her cause I don't know what her actual name is, but she was working alongside with Gabriel uh, in other movies. I don't know how much I've like mentioned her because she's not really that important. She just says like offhanded comments and you can tell that she's attracted to Gabriel. She becomes a bit more important or I feel like she's going to be more so in the next movie because Giuseppe emails her. Apparently they have some type of relationship. They had a sexual relationship at one point. Um, and he's like, hey, I heard uh, Emerson's speech. It was much to be desired. Um, I also met him and his fiance. Being that Bitchy Bangs works with um, Gabriel pretty often, news of him having a fiance is news to her. So she's like, he has a fiance, what? And also again, she's attracted to him. So she's like jealous, you know? Well, what's her name? And then we spend most of the movie waiting for her to get the email confirmation of who this woman is. And again, must I remind you that if people find out that they're together, he loses his job. So yeah, it was a really great idea to bring your student to like a conference where people who all study your niche things are hanging out together. Great idea. I just, I just hate the, I just don't like sloppy. If you're gonna do it, plan accordingly. Julia asks Gabriel to pay to get her scar removed from the attack. Um, and he agrees because, you know, she's been living with this reminder of her trauma. She wants to get rid of it. And he's like, sure, I'll do that for you. He says in return, he would like to ask a favor of her. And his favor is that she talks to a therapist about all her trauma, about the experiences she's gone through with her ex, with him, with, her family, you know, she should be talking to a professional about all of these things. Like he's a difficult person to be with as well. And he has a difficult past. She encourages him to do the same because, you know, she's really concerned about how jealous and angry he got after he saw her with Giuseppe. They kind of romanticize how they have compatible brokenness or whatever. And it's like, okay, but I'm gonna just take the good 
over the bad. I appreciate that we're encouraging people to get mental health services after as traumatic of lives both of you had had. So pick your battles. They go off to a villa in Umbria. And around this time, I'm like, I'm gonna need someone to start snatching some wigs. I'm getting bored. I don't wanna just see y'all have sex and have a great time. I've probably skipped some sex scenes at this point. There's no point of even mentioning them. But they go to this villa and she, again, is very big on proving that she's pleasing to him because again, she has a lot of trauma around feeling not good enough sexually. She offers to, improvise on the flute. And he's like, oh yeah, if you <laughs> like, if you want to. Um, but again, this act also shows that she does have trauma. She can't quite bring herself to do it. You can tell she gets quite nervous. And he's like, you don't, you don't have to do it. Like, well, first of all, she offered. <laughs> and I understand that this is her trying to like work through that, but like, you don't, I mean, you don't have to do it. They take a shower together, wash away their respective traumas. I guess symbolically, it's a very long scene. Um, but at the end of which she's shocker still traumatized. <laughs> Imagine going to somebody with trauma and being like, have you considered bathing? <laughs> so they finally come back to Toronto. Julia meets up with her father. If you recall, they have a bit of a tumultuous relationship mainly because he is, well, was dating her ex best friend. This is very ghetto. Her ex best friend's mom. And the reason why Julia and that girl are no longer friends is because that friend had sex with her abusive ex, Simon. So now she has problems with her father because he was still dating that ex friend's mother. There you go. Got it? Follow. But during this conversation, we find out that he um, has broken up with her um, because she seems to believe that Simon didn't attack Julia in the last movie. They break up because of that. So that helps to be like a reconciling moment for them. The dad goes off to the bathroom and here comes the ex friend, Natalie. Again, another antagonistic woman <laughs> in Julia's life. And when she comes in, she comes in to threaten Julia to take back her claims of assault from Simon, because Simon's father is a politician, like a senator or something, and it looks bad to have a son who has criminal allegations going on right now. Um, she's like, take it back, or we're gonna release your revenge photos online, and how embarrassing it would be to see you performing a very normal sexual act. <laughs> like they, they try to, they kind of like frame it as if it's just like, not even just like embarrassing in the sense of you violating someone's like life like that, but also in this like, look at you, you're not as innocent. It's like, she gave head, shut up. What if people found out how embarrassing it is that you do a thing that sexually active adults often do? <laughs> like what? What will people do when they find out that you're 23 and sexually active? You whore, you old scarlet bitch whore. And Julia's like, no bitch, f you. I am not gonna take away what I said. Cause he, one, he did do those things. Um, and also I have leverage in like the Washington Post to show that he is a terrible person and that he already has a DUI and whatever going back and forth. If you're gonna come in to blackmail somebody, you gotta come again, sloppy. Bad work, 4D chess it, I'm tired. Y'all don't plan ahead, y'all don't think bigger. <laughs> the only reason you're doing this is you're just mad that he chose me over you because you don't even know how to give a blow job. What is with this movie's obsession with giving good hit? <laughs> you were completely undermined as a woman because you don't know how to give sloppy toppy like I do. Oh, bitch, aim higher. <laughs> I'm better because I've sacrificed my gag reflex for a man. What have you done? It's like, bitch, I can eat food and not choke to death. I go so hard, I don't even have to chew my food anymore. <laughs> so it's like, for a man, ew, gross. Anyway, Natalie finally gets thrown out of the restaurant um, and Julia's left in shambles. Fast forward and it's Christmas time, happiest time of the year. Um, and Julia and Gabriel are visiting his family. But when they get there, they see Paulina. Paulina, um, my knee jerk is to call her the retired baby mama, but that's really fucked up. And I'm sure. Um, but you know what I mean? I don't know what to call her because she wasn't his ex, right? They never dated. And they used to have a kid together. 
Maybe mama in retirement. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, anyway, she's there. Paulina's there. And she's, again, another antagonistic chick in their lives. She kind of walks up to Julia and she's like, who are you? She also says this odd, out of nowhere comment again about giving dome. <laughs> again, what is this movie's obsession? <laughs> you aren't like the most actualized woman until you're amphibious. You don't even have to breathe air. <laughs> but anyway, she comes to talk to him about some things. They end up having a very, very long conversation away from everybody. So it makes everyone feel uncomfortable and suspicious. He comes back, he basically has a conversation with his father who ends up saying, you should propose essentially to Julia to prove that you're committed. Cause up until now, it just seems like another person you're having sex with. Now. Considering they've only been dating for a very short amount of time, maybe a few weeks, that seems hasty, but it's something that he suggests and I'm sure that's gonna come up soon. He comes back to bed early in the morning, having spent a long time with Paulina, quote unquote, talking and it makes everyone feel very skeptical and suspicious. And he asserts that, you know, nothing happened. Her popping up was just another desperate attempt at getting back with him, you know. Um, we find out a few more little things about Gabriel and Julia and their relationship. One, that they have differing opinions on religion. She still believes in God and Gabriel, after the death of his child, doesn't seem to believe that there is this higher being that is merciful if he was able to live that life. And, and that Julia had such a hard life too, but she exerts that, you know, regardless of what I go through, I believe in God because of the good things in the world or whatever. Another thing we find out is that Gabriel has a foot fetish. Well, a shoe fetish, I guess, and semantics. Here's the thing, this is a side note, this is just, <laughs> Kendall's opinions on foot fetishes, <laughs> here you go. Of all fetishes, I find feet to be one that people get really disgusted by and I don't understand why? Like, I'm not into it. Maybe I'm halfway into it. I like hands. What's the difference? Like, I've heard people into much kookier than feet. I would date a man with a foot fetish, especially if he into rubbing feet. <laughs> Free pedicures? Why are we knocking this? Why are we, why are we shaming this? He'd probably buy you shoes. Think bigger. Y'all really small minded and it shows because <laughs> that hurt. That was tight on there. They have a gift exchange. And at first we don't know what Gabriel gets, but we find out later that he receives a photo of his deceased daughter from Paulina. Uh, this upsets him greatly. And he goes out of the house, kind of storms out, goes for a walk. Julia goes up after him. <laughs> Julia, you know, being the saint that she is, she's like, you know, she needs help. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, before this, Gabriel's father was um, insisting that he give the trust that he originally made for Paulina and their child that they had together. Um, he, he insisted that he gives that to Paulina because she needs help, but that sh he must insist that she gets like a rehab or something. Here comes uh, Julia being her saintly self, like, you know, um, she's going through a lot. She's the mother of your child, you know, and Gabriel gets really defensive because she apparently, while they were at the hotel, made a move, made a pass at him. This becomes like this unraveling argument about how they actually didn't stop having sex years ago, which is what he uh, suggested prior to this, that they actually only stopped having sex about a year ago, which would definitely change a lot of timelines that he had misrepresented up until this point. So they didn't stop having sex in grad school, which would have been about, you know, give or take eight to 10 years ago. They very recently, relatively stopped having sex. And Julia's like disgusted by that because, you know, they weren't together, but she was more in his life than he led on to believe, right? So after they had had the child, after the child had passed, they were still interacting with each other. Julia's like, do you love her? Did you ever love her? He said, no, he never loved her. He had an affection for her, he had, to some degree an addiction to her, but he never loved her, which, <sighs> sorry, that was my own dating history, but I had a trauma flashback. <laughs> I'll just say I've been kinda Julia before and it's not fun, but she's like, I'm confused. You slept, you slept with her for years. You had a baby with her 
and you can do all that and not feel anything for her. You just kind of threw her away. You, you fed her scraps of you. You used her. How am I supposed to believe that you wouldn't do this to me? <clears throat> Again, trauma flashback, sorry. <laughs> she asks if Paulina ever forgave him and he kind of just says, Julia, you're the only person I love. This scene was actually shockingly triggering. I'm not gonna go into my dating life, but um, I, I've been in situations with a weirdness with an ex. And uh, if you are listening to this video and you feel anything <laughs> like this, you're like, I don't like how you are with your ex, leave. Run, bitch. Run now. <laughs> go. Leave. Pack your sh Get the f out. I'm so happy I don't do story times anymore. <laughs> Y'all would know too much of my business. She's like, don't lie to me again. And he's like, I'll never lie to you, blah, 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 whatever. And then we finally wrap up the movie. Uh, we are back with Bitchy Bangs and she finally gets that email back from Giuseppe that says that the, the fiance's name is Julia Mitchell, who is her classmate, which means that a student is sleeping with Mr. Gabriel Emerson. But anyway, that's the end of the movie. This movie, again, drags in the beginning, but we do get picked up. I do wanna see what happens in the next movie, Gabriel's Rapture Part Two. It is out already. I wanna know if we're ever gonna get Mommy Dom back, because they really introduced her for no reason. Um, but we got Paulina, we got Bitchy Bangs, we got Natalie, we got all these like <laughs> antagonistic women, which feels inherently misogynistic. Why am I surprised the whole series is misogynistic? It's f Romance traditionally is quite as well, but anyway. I want to step away a bit from Gabriel's Inferno as far as passion flicks film, because there's been a lot coming out that I haven't watched yet. There's this one called Tangled that looks terrible. I need some more like compressed chaos, like a singular one shot movie that's just wild. Um, instead of this like long series that this is. So if you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media. Check out More Butter where I have a podcast called In Defense Of. We peaked at like number six uh, on Spotify TV and film podcast. Crazy, that's hilarious. Uh, by the time you see this episode, three should be up. So I will link that down below as well. Feel free to follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. And I will see you guys next time.